Hi guys. Hi. I hope you can hear me. If you can hear me, please leave a comment below. So this morning I wanted to talk to you about something that's really exciting for us at the Canadian Constitution Foundation. It's a new project that we're working on on the legacy of the pandemic, of the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada. And it is a brand new book that is being released this October. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it's written by me and by the CCF's executive director, Joanna Barron, and it presents a critical and comprehensive assessment of the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on civil liberties. It's available on Amazon now for pre-order. It's a record really of what happened to our rights during the pandemic from a perspective that civil liberties and fundamental freedoms actually matter in Canada. And the, the response of many people to the pandemic uh, has been to forget a lot of things. You know, there were strange and irrational and oppressive things that the government did. And we've kind of put them into this memory hole and forgotten about them. And I think it is so important that we don't forget that these things happened because we are not that unlikely to see another pandemic in our lifetime. And if we don't remember the lessons that we needed to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic, we are at risk of these kinds of things happening again. So the book is being published in October. We have a publisher. It's called Optimum Publishing International. The book actually already in pre-sale alone is at number one on Amazon in three different categories. And it's already listed on Amazon's Hot 100 list. And we have a foreword for the book by one of my political heroes, Preston Manning, who I love. He's just the nicest person in politics, in my opinion. I think the risk is that if we forget what happened, if we forget the history of the pandemic, if we forget these cases, these legal challenges, and the bizarre things that happened, then it will repeat itself. And the government can violate our rights again with impunity. Reading this book that we have coming out this October is going to help to ensure that these violations don't happen again, or that if governments attempt them, there will be an informed citizenry to help push back. So we're going to talk throughout this book about what went wrong from a nuanced perspective of uh, given by, by me and Joanna, constitutional lawyers, of when government reactions were over the top, when the courts failed to correct government overreach. And it's really a balanced perspective. So this morning, what I wanted to do was I wanted to read you the opening of the book, the introduction, to sort of set the tone of what you can expect from the book coming out this October, um, which is available for pre-order now. So let me read you the introduction. I'm I'm so excited about this project. I've been working on this book for, it feels like <laughs> since the pandemic started, I started creating a record of all of the things that were happening. Obviously we were involved in a lot of cases, but this book has been a really long labor and I'm so grateful to all the people who have supported us by already, already pre-ordering. So with that said, let me read you the introduction to the book. In October of 2022, economist Emily Oster wrote a plea for what she called pandemic amnesty. After detailing various ill-conceived public health policies cobbled together throughout the pandemic, Oster concluded that the standard saying is that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. But dwelling on mistakes of history can lead to a repetitive doom loop as well. She reasoned that many admittedly poor public health decisions were made in an information vacuum and that the salubrious thing to do going forward would be to forgive and forget. Oster was concerned about the social fabric fraying as a result of pol polarizing online discourse, and she urged the need to move forward. However, our anecdotal experience has shown that a second common response to the pandemic mishaps is actually going blank entirely on what occurred during that time. We've observed this phenomenon where the surreal, sometimes inane, often unprecedented and unusual public health measures taken over the roughly three-year pandemic period were memory hold. The mind completely fogs over. Many times over the course of writing this book, we messaged one another, Joanna and I, my co-author and I, messaged one another after unearthing yet another public policy absurdity. 
the city of Toronto taping off cherry blossoms, or Quebec requiring unvaccinated people to be chaperoned in plexiglass carts through essential aisles of big box stores. Now, we are not psychologists, but we can see that there must be some type of evolutionary benefit to allowing a collective trauma to dissolve into the slipstream. It's unproductive to dwell on how we got by and how our government coped in real time. Our memories are warped, first by the primacy effect, our tendency to remember firsts, like um, exemplified by people universally naming George Washington when asked to remember a former U.S. president. Uh, most, Most people have crystal clear memory of the moment the plague year started in earnest. Uh, and for many uh, others, it was for many of us, it was it was March 11th of 2020. That that was the day that the NBA suspended games for the rest of the season. If you have a specific memory of when the COVID pandemic kind of became a serious issue for governments around the world, or that you started thinking, "Hey, this is uh, this is actually going to impact my life," leave it in the comment below. I'd be interested to hear when your experience was. Mine was, I had gone up to the cottage to celebrate my birthday. Um, I was visiting my family in Northern Ontario with my husband and my kids. And we were hoping to go and spend um, my birthday at a local restaurant. And the day uh, we were supposed to go, the restaurants all closed down. And we ended up remaining up north for weeks. These extraordinary and immediate changes to virtually every aspect of our daily lives, that is really etched into our memories. But as the pandemic dragged on, most of the various lockdowns, reopenings, stay-at-home orders, regulations, ordinances, it all kind of just melted into a gray area that has less significance in our individual recollections. To take just, you know, one of an infinite number of examples, you might not remember an incident in December of 2020 And at that point, it was already well established that COVID did not or very rarely spread outdoors. In that case, two Calgary police officers arrested a 21-year-old man for skating outside. And when the man asked why he was being grabbed by the police, an officer said to him, get on the ground before I effing tase you. To watch that video is to be reminded of the grotesque occurrences that for a period of time, became normalized. So the book that Joanna and I have written aims to serve as something of a corrective record to the frailties of our collective memories. The British Medical Journal recently called for a national inquiry into Canada's public health response to COVID-19, declaring that the world expected more of Canada. And we, the authors of this book, Joanna and I, we respectfully claim the same as merited with regard to Canada's treatment of constitutional rights. The Fathers of Confederation placed a high value, a high premium on liberty. But unlike the American revolutionaries who often spoke of liberty as an a priori, a beginning concept found in the laws of nature itself and rooted in individual rights, Canada's founders were inspired by the Anglo-Irish philosopher Edmund Burke's notion of liberty. And for them, liberty was not an individual endeavor, but was formed in social freedom, which is secured by well-constructed institutions. And for this reason, Burke famously described the French Revolution as causing more destruction and suffering than freedom. Now, Canada's founders and early statesmen saw liberty as a function of political society and human experience, and therefore to be defined and limited by the people themselves through their elected representatives. When liberty doesn't exist as an a priori or beginning concept, but instead must be mediated through the people's representatives, this groupthink and political convenience can actually do a lot of damage. From the outset of the pandemic, Canadians witnessed an extraordinary and mainly uncontested outgrowth of government powers and assaults on individual liberties. The McDonald Laurier Institute, a not-for-profit that does amazing work in Canada, they had a COVID misery index globally, and they ranked Canada's pandemic misery in unemployment and excess inflation as among the worst in the world. Any way that you calculate it, there's plenty of misery to go around coming out of the pandemic. 
Canada's most populous provinces, Ontario and Quebec, endured some of the world's longest lockdowns. I think a lot of us recall the misery associated with the extended school closures. Restaurants in Toronto were shut down for more than 360 days over the course of the pandemic. That's the longest period of any city in the world. Schools were shut uh, in Ontario for more than seven months between March 2020 and January 2022. And as for the economic and social consequences, I actually think we are only just starting to see the beginnings uh, with with increased levels of uh, mental uh, illness and drug addiction that we're seeing in major cities. So the book that we have written about the pandemic, Civil Liberties Legacy, moves sequentially through the fundamental freedoms guaranteed by the Canadian Constitution, primarily the Charter, but also the rights guaranteed in Constitution Act 1867. So we go through all kinds of different rights. In Chapter 2, we look at the right to freedom of assembly and the democratic lifeblood that is the right to protest. Chapters 3 and 4 take a sober look at the epic defining freedom convoy and the subsequent invocation of the Emergencies Act and our judicial review of the use of the Emergencies Act, which saw the Trudeau government for the first time in history invoke that extraordinary set of laws that are quite draconian state powers. In chapter five of the book, we discuss movement restrictions going back to the early days of the first wave of the pandemic when you might remember the maritime provinces put in place a flurry of interprovincial travel restrictions. And we have a lengthy deep dive into the ultimately misconstrued federal travel hotel programs, the federal quarantine programs, uh, and the challenge that we at the Canadian Constitution Foundation led against it. Chapter six of the book, looks at various privacy implications of the pandemic measures, including the notoriously expensive and uh, unpopular COVID alert app that was barely used. Uh, we look at vaccine passports, snitch lines, snitch culture, and cell phone data tracking. Chapter seven of the book highlights the asymmetrical effects of public health measures that it had on Canadians, including disabled Ontarians who were barred from assessing uh, accessing, um, you know, mobility therapy by being banned from gyms and individuals who suffered from known medical complications from a COVID-19 vaccine that were left unaccommodated by the British Columbia medical uh, vaccine passport system. We rep we were working with a, uh, a girl in British Columbia who developed an adverse reaction to her dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. She had heart inflammation that uh, was diagnosed. There's no question that it was associated with the vaccine. It's one of the most common complications. And the government had to originally told her if she wanted an exemption to be able to go into public spaces like restaurants and movie theaters, she would need to apply on an activity by activity basis. So getting government and bureaucratic approval to live her everyday life with the permission of the government. One of the areas most ravaged by the pandemic policies, we think, was freedom of expression, with staggering restrictions placed on individuals' abilities to share information and engage in debate, including a case where a judge imposed one of the most extreme compelled speech orders of any country in the world during the pandemic. We discussed that in Chapter 7. The case was about a person who was... Um, attended anti-lockdown protests. He violated a number of uh, public health restrictions and the judge ordered him on his on bail that the condition of his bail was that if he were to speak publicly about COVID-19, he also needed to include some disclaimer about the, the type that you see pop up on videos on YouTube when you talk about COVID that says, the World Health Organization says this about COVID. And the judge in granting him his bail, wrote out what he expected this man to say if he wanted to publicly speak about COVID, a totally unconstitutional type of order. So chapter eight of the book covers the devastating effects of lockdowns that they had on the ability of religious congregations to gather and worship. And it discusses why religious freedom attracts unique constitutional protections, looking at various court challenges to lockdown orders, including some that we participated in. In chapter nine of the book, we review one of the most intensely polarizing issues of the pandemic, 
which we do touch on a little in another chapter, but we do dedicate chapter nine to the entire issue of vaccine mandates and passports and the differential treatment of unvaccinated individuals, which at times um, in Quebec, they even raised the notion of imposing an un, an unvax tax or a vax tax. If you were not vaccinated, you have to pay a special tax. They didn't ultimately go through with that mercifully, but the notion that this was something even considered is completely mind blowing. Finally, public emergencies often go hand in hand with politicians skirting ordinary legislative procedures with the goal of defending public safety. And Canada's experience with COVID was no different. In chapter 10 of the book, which is about dem democracy and the rule of law, we look at extended states of emergency legislative power grabs, and other really worrying irregularities that occurred at various levels of government. So as you go through this book, we ask that you you read it with an open mind. Over the course of the pandemic, we saw worldviews uh, of many thoughtful and intelligent friends of ours really uh, crystallize into this absolute uniform narrative that you could only think one way. And the underlying reality of how the pandemic affected our rights it is uneven. It is complex. So whether you fall into a camp that believes the pandemic constituted, you know, a generational health threat and most public health um, measures were justified, or whether you think that governments lurch towards unjustified power grabs, I think that the book, whatever your perspective, it is going to challenge that internal narrative that you have. So I am just so thrilled that I have this book coming out um, this is not an actual copy of the book. This is just a, a, a copy of the cover. And I really hope that you guys will uh, order it, support the work that we do. It has been a labor of love to get this book published. I'm so proud that we have a publisher who's working with us because this is always controversial stuff, no matter what you're saying um, about, the, the, about uh, the pandemic and about civil liberties. So thank you all so much for watching today. And I hope that you will order the book. It's already a number one bestseller on Amazon as a pre-order. So um, thanks so much for the congratulations. I'm reading some of the notes there. Um, it has been it has been a lot of work to get this done. So uh, thanks thanks to all of you for your support. And we will speak again soon. Bye.